Yeah. Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to another edition. I have with me John Nugent. And John actually is a participant in another podcast. Why don't you tell our two listeners uh, about that (laughs) podcast? Sit up, you two. (laughs) (laughs) Pay attention. (laughs) Uh, I teach Bible and theology at Great Lakes Christian College. And two of my colleagues there, Ron Peters and Sam Long, uh, Ron teaches New Testament and Sam teaches Old Testament. And I do a little bit of old and new and theology. And we decided we wanted to do a podcast together. And we want it to be of value to our students and especially to uh, thinking Christians in the church. And so it's uh, it's called the After Class Podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever podcasts are. Or just type in After Class Podcast in Google and it'll take you to our webpage and you can listen to them or subscribe to them. Uh, but basically in each episode we spend about 45 minutes talking about contemporary Christian questions mm-hmm. uh, from the perspective of three professors and it's it's like continuing education for our students after they leave we found our former students and alumni of the college really enjoy kind of staying up on biblical studies um, and engaging the topics that are important in their churches and hearing what are, what are these bible nerds who <laughs> spent way too much time in school have to say about these topics and we've been doing it now for i think about 37 episodes Oh, wow. And uh, really enjoy it. So we're, we've begun our second season, and we've talked about issues like immigration, um, why we shouldn't unhitch the Old Testament from Christianity. Mm. Uh, rant. We won't mention his name in response to a well-known <laughs> celebrity preacher. So ranging from practical contemporary questions and issues to you know weighty theological issues like what happens to the body after death. So come check it out sometime if you enjoyed some of the kind of stuff that. Uh, Frank and I talk about. You may be interested in uh, yeah. hearing what Sam and Ron and I talk about. And also, if you're new to my work, I have two other podcasts. One is the Christ is All podcast, which I started in 2009, and that has over 125 episodes. All are on different topics, but they share a common theme, and that is the centrality and supremacy of Jesus Christ with a heavy emphasis on God's eternal purpose. And it's a mixture, it's eclectic. There's monologues in it, there is a lot of humor in it, some commercials break into some of the episodes that you will never hear anywhere else, and perhaps (laughs) you never want to remember that you ever heard. There are interviews, there are messages, spoken messages and conferences that have been recorded, and then there are book chapters from some of my books. So that's Christ is All, and you can find that at frankviola.com info forward slash podcast and then there's another podcast that i released just before the book insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom came out and that's called the deeper journey and there's only 12 episodes with a bonus or two after it there are three minute episodes Hmm. and each one each episode is three minutes except for the last one it's a whole message addressing a different aspect of the gospel of the kingdom but it's a monologue it's not a conversation like this and so you may want to check that out. That's at frankviola.me, me, frankviola.me. So there you have it. You've got this podcast and three other podcasts that have been introduced to you. And so you don't have to listen to another podcast as long as you live. You can feed on these for the rest of your life. I just heard a bunch of phones shut off. Uh, <laughs> no, but these will keep you busy if you uh, dare to listen. So today what we're going to do, John, we talked about it. And we decided we would talk about one of the subjects that is a hot button issue right now. It is an issue that you addressed in your book, Endangered Gospel. It's an issue that I addressed in Insurgents, and it has captured the hearts, minds, and spirits of many young people, particularly those in their 20s. And it is this issue of social justice and being a social justice warrior, quote unquote. And John, I think you and I are joined at the hip on this. I just see so many believers who have 
imbibed the old time social gospel, which basically amounts to our job is to make the world a better place. We do it by leveraging political power and social activism. And the result of this is that the body of Christ has almost been hijacked to be governed by the current social problems of the day. That whatever is in the news, whatever is going on, we now have our talking points as Christian people, and we are now obligated to weigh in to those issues, to those problems, and we are to try to solve them. And this is often talked about in the context of the kingdom of God. So if people are engaging in social activism or they're engaging in trying to change laws, then they call that kingdom work. Yeah. And you and I have a lot of resonance on this whole issue and you've articulated it very well. So I want to talk about this. And I guess I'm just going to uh, say that the potato is hot, John, and go ahead and weigh in first. <laughs> sure. Yeah, my concern, my dog in this fight is is not that... It's not that the Bible doesn't care about social justice. I mean, this burning inside of people to be socially responsible, to care about the plight of poor people, of to care about injustice and broken structures and oppression, that's coming, I think, from a good place. Uh, Our God is a God who cares about all of his creation, all of his creatures, and all of its structures. Uh, And uh, there is abundant... A testimony in the prophets where where the God's anointed people called out social injustices happening in Israel as major problems that if God's people don't get straight then God's favor will leave his people mm-hmm. and and so I don't think either of us want to say you shouldn't be caring so much about social justice right. Uh, right you should care about it but you should care about it the way the father cares about it or at least the way the father has positioned us as his people to do something about it. And so the danger, and, and this is tied to endangered gospel, like even why I chose that title for my book, is that God's response, God's first and foremost response to the social injustices of this world is to create for himself a set apart people who live out his justice together Amen. in community. Amen. And our our social justice passion needs to first and foremost pour into living out that vision together Amen. in community. Amen. And it's from that commitment that our that we can be a witness, that we have something right. to say uh, to a world that wouldn't know justice if it hit them upside the head. Yes. So I guess I want to begin by affirming you're hungry for social justice. Excellent. We mm-hmm. don't want to That's right. in any way uh, dampen that, but to say, are you channeling that the way God has called you to in Scripture? Or are you simply mimicking what the powers and principalities of this world do when it comes to social justice, only doing it in the name of Jesus, which is a different social justice agenda? Yeah, I think there's so many directions in which we can go right now. One of them is that social justice, just like evangelism, has become an idol to many Christians. Uh, I have met many Christians who serve the God of service rather than Jesus Christ. Serving the God of service. That service can become a God in itself. That can become an idol. That can become the identifier where a person receives their identity. They worship at the altar of service. And people have done this historically with evangelism. Evangelism becomes everything kind of the ball has moved over now to social justice because oftentimes evangelism historically has kind of ignored people who are in need, physical need. It's all about yeah. what the soul is doing, the state of their soul. You know, are they going to heaven when they die? Now there's been that movement away from that emphasis to, okay, what about the people who have problems today? And so it becomes an idol. And let me give you an example, a concrete example of this. I was talking to a person, and I mentioned it in my book, who basically signed off to anything that was deep, anything related to spiritual growth, anything related to knowing the Lord better, anything related to spiritual transformation, because, quote-unquote, she was hungry for justice. Her whole landscape, the mountain in which she lived, breathed, and had her being was social justice. That was everything. 
And it is possible to put one's soul in justice and seeking justice and leave Jesus Christ out in the cold because the two are not the same. You know, this is a point that I made in a book entitled Jesus Manifesto that I co-authored with another author. The point was Jesus Christ and his teachings are connected. If you follow Jesus Christ and if you know Jesus Christ and if you're learning to live by him, by his indwelling spirit, you will automatically fulfill his teachings. But you can try to follow his teachings and not even have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not the same. Jesus, the person, and his teachings are not the same. But one, Christ, will lead you to the other, but the other won't necessarily lead you to Christ. That is a gaping problem that many people face and uh, that is observed. The other thing is, there's a distinction between engaging in humanitarian efforts that help people and that improve aspects of the world. There's a difference between that and doing the work of the kingdom. And one of the things, John, that I have thought about, and sometimes if you blow something up really big, you see it more clearly. So imagine if we waved a wand right now, and in the morning when we all woke up on planet Earth, the following things would disappear. Every war would end. Every person who is hungry and in poverty would now have food. All crime would stop. All oppression would end. Racism, sexism, hatred would vanish. So imagine a world like that. Okay, the question then is, would the kingdom of God have come to earth? And many people would say yes. And my answer to that is that the answer would be no, because where is Jesus Christ? Even if all of that happened, if the people of this planet were not giving their allegiance to Jesus Christ and enthroning him as Lord, you would not have the kingdom of God because you can't separate the kingdom of God from the king. And I think this is a big mistake that's at the heart of a lot of the social justice emphasis is that people are trying to do good in the world, quote unquote, Let's put it this way. So many movements that have put a dent in the problems of the world, like racism. Racism is still here. The civil rights movement was good, but it's still here. It hasn't gone away. But where was Jesus Christ? Where was the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom? In that movement, was that front and center? The answer is no. You have atheists and agnostics who are part of that. And the message was justice. It wasn't the enthroning of Christ. John. With the civil rights, I mean, it, it was there in where it started, right, with King's work among the church. But then when the world got a hold of King's Christ-centered vision and turned it into their mm-hmm. vision, then mm-hmm. the Christ part is left out, and just the social justice, the thing that the world wanted, became the center. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. I, You know, my the slogan that I kind of use that even led to writing the book In Danger Gospel is... God has not called us to make the world a better place, mm. but to be the better place Absolutely. that God has made in this world through Christ. Amen. That's right. And uh, and that's so the again the issue with getting caught up in the humanitarian causes of this world is what Jesus says about you cannot serve two masters, mm-hmm. and and I think that means you cannot serve two kingdoms. And that's so if right. service becomes the God and and the master that's being served is the American uh, nation, right, the nation of America, then all that service is toward another kingdom, to making another kingdom get incrementally better than it is today. Uh, but this is one of those kingdoms, according to the scriptures, that is passing away. <laughs> yes. That will be removed when Christ is exalted above all the kingdoms and nations of this earth. And so to invest our time, energy, and service into improving a kingdom that is passing away misses out on the whole story of Scripture. That God, through the offspring of Abraham, is creating for himself a people, a kingdom, uh, who are to be in this world a demonstration plot of God's good designs for this creation. And so to do away with all of the social ills and problems of society when you stripped it all the way, what's not left is a society properly ordered under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
what's left is a society that still fundamentally lives for its own selfish endeavors and is going to just foster a new set of injustices. That's right. And so we are eager for the presence of the reign of Christ. Our time, energy, and resources go to building up uh, a people who would be a witness to God's kingdom, which is the kingdom that is replacing the kingdoms of this this world. world. That is our obsession. That is our social justice obsession. And so I think it helps to distinguish, you know, to know whether your social justice is kingdom-centered, God's kingdom-centered, is to ask what is the role that, how integral is the church family, uh, the ecclesia, right, in your social justice service? Yes. Uh, If you could do what you're doing without the church family, then you can be sure that the service you're rendering is unto Caesar. Uh, and not unto the Lord Jesus Christ, because his people uh, is the kingdom that he's building that is his image of a just society. Uh, It's the thing we committed to in our baptisms. Well, this opens up so much, and my brain is going in various directions here. The modern social justice movement is, in effect, using the world system which is under the power of the enemy, the world system, and and I've talked about it in my book, we've discussed it. It's using and leveraging the power of the world system to fix and change the world system. And so the result of that is it's not going to bring the kingdom of God, what Jesus called the kingdom of God, what the apostles called the kingdom of God. It's not going to advance the kingdom of God. And it's not even going to remedy the problems of the world. The problems of the world are going to continue with us. I mean, the first human beings who broke the womb of a woman, well, one of them murdered the other. I mean, we've had these problems from the beginning. Yeah, when Jesus flooded the world of all sinfulness, and it was a, a clean slate, that, yeah. that scenario you just created, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? After the flood, the yep. very next thing it says, and the human heart is always evil from youth. Uh, and then Noah and his son have this sinful encounter. <laughs> and exactly. we're plunged right back into plunged it. Plunged right back into it. You, you don't have the presence of a new order yet That's until right. Abraham. When we talk about our task as disciples and followers of Jesus is not to make the world a better place, but to be the better place in the world. I think a lot of people hear that and say, well, yeah, sure, I am the better place. I'm a better person. Jesus has changed my heart, and so now I'm going to go ahead and change the world. So that's how they hear that. Also, too, when we use the word church, you describe the church is to be the better place. Immediately what populates the minds of most people is that building down the street that has a service for two hours on Sunday. People listen to a sermon, throw money in an offering plate, sing some worship songs, and then go home to live their individualistic Christian lives, which is extremely busy with all sorts of things during the week, with mostly with the children and so forth, and then just to go back the next Sunday. That's not what you're talking about when you say church. It's not what I'm talking about when I say church. In fact, I pretty well drop the word church, and I'd rather use the term kingdom community. Mm -hmm. Because in the first century, when you look at that word that's translated church, ecclesia, some pronounce it ecclesia, ecclesia, this was a local group of people who had a shared life together. Yes. They knew each other well. In fact, not only did they know each other well, they loved each other. Not only did they love each other, I'm talking about the first century Ecclesia folks, they married each other, they buried each other. And this body of believers in the eyesight of God was a beautiful woman, the most beautiful woman in the world, the bride of the Son of God, the glorious fiancé of Jesus Christ. And she, I'm speaking of that community of believers in a local city, was incredibly magnetic because of the shared life she had and she had that shared life because she was living by a life not her own she was living not by fallen human life but by divine life Christ was living in her in the members and that was an exciting 
group of people to be around. It turned the Roman Empire on its ear. People in that day never seen anything like it. Here was Jew and Gentile who historically have hated one another. Yeah, never ate meals together. Uh, absolutely. The Jew would spit when he said the word Gentile. The prejudice and animosity and enmity and hatred ran far deeper than black and white in our culture. And yet, here they are, Jews and Gentiles, walking arm in arm into the marketplace, giving one another's jobs, the rich people in the body of Christ giving to the poor people so that there is an equality. And there you had justice, you had love, you had forbearance, you had all these things that the world is seeking for. You had this in microcosmic form in this body of believers. That's what the better place is. Absolutely. And of course, it wasn't without its problems. I mean, the New Testament is mostly an account of an apostle writing to these kingdom communities that were in crisis. But they survived them, and they overcame them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the problem, John. When we talk about this, most people listening will say, I've never seen anything like what you're talking about. I have visited churches. I've been part of many churches. What you're talking about doesn't exist in my experience. That's one of the, the main challenges. The text from Galatians 6, verse 10. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all. So that embraces all humans, the fallen people of the world mm -hmm. who don't know the Lord, as we all once were. And especially, first priority, for those of the family of faith. And there's a text in Thessalonians that basically says the same thing. He gives a priority, you know, do good to all, but first to the family of God. So talk a little bit about the priority, because I think, I think what happens is that Christians look at many churches that have become insular to the point where they're absorbed with themselves, their programs. Really, mostly what, that's what it is. It's their programs. Mm -hmm. It's not the building together of of one another of being built together into God's house. It's the programs. They're busy with their own programs. And so you have someone looking at that and saying, well, I don't want to be a navel gazer. We need to care about the people around us. So speak to that. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot there. And yeah. I'm trying to think of the best way to frame it. I want to put a wider frame on it and then zoom in on that question. And, and so when we talk about not wanting to make this world a better place, not being called to make this world a better place, but to be the better place God has made in this world through Christ, the, the problem with, I just, I want to bring the kingdom by just, you know, feeding the poor and clothing the naked. I, I want to make this world a better place. I want to make it the kingdom. Uh, the heresy in that statement is that it acts as if God didn't already bring the kingdom through Jesus. It's like, in, when we say that, in our mind, the yes. kingdom hasn't come yet. And the confession of the early church that made him this vibrant kingdom that you talk about, this spotless bride, you know, uh, these people who loved one another so much that the world mm -hmm. got, you know, swept off its feet by our love for one another, is because they embraced the kingdom that God had brought through Jesus. That yes. the kingdom has already begun. God's mm -hmm. new creation has already begun Amen. in world history. That's right. And it takes form, and, and I love your phrase, in these kingdom communities. These people whose life together is enamored with the kingdom, seeks the kingdom first, makes the kingdom first, uh, the life rhythm of their life together. And you can't have that without the king, the presence of the king. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And if the kingdom has already come, and begun and we all and this goes with the disclaimer it hasn't come in full we're waiting mm -hmm. for christ the king to return mm -hmm. and bring the kingdom in its fullness uh, but if it's already begun it's like to encounter the kingdom is to encounter this treasure in a field and you realize that you've got to leave everything else behind by the field and get the treasure mm -hmm. because it is now the obsession of your life yes. and, and so i think people want two things at the same time they want to affirm that the kingdom should be manifested in the church community, right? As uh, the kingdom community, as we invest our time, energy, and resources into loving one another. But they don't want to be insular, right? right? And so they want to leave that and go make the world a better place mm -hmm. by fixing the social structures of the world, right. the order that's passing away. If, if we turn our 
back to what God is trying to do in the church family um, and building that kingdom community to fix the world. And then we wonder why the world isn't that kingdom community like is described in the New Testament. It's because we have prioritized the world that's at right. the expense of the church. Oh, that's so good. That's exactly what it is. Um, and, and you only have that kingdom community when you have uh, members of that community who prioritize the kingdom witness of that community. Mm -hmm. Once we stop prioritizing the kingdom community for our jobs, for raising the perfect American family, for cleaning up Washington or the local city or the streets, once we turn our back on the kingdom community to seek to build the community somewhere else out of different raw materials than uh, the gifts that Christ poured out on the church, then it's no wonder that you don't have this church that looks like the vision spelled out in the New Testament. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it has to do with we don't become that kingdom community without selling all of our possessions and investing our life into the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Uh, that is what is uh, the raw material of the kingdom community is a radically sold out people who are like that. And that's why there are churches like this in the world today. <laughs> but that's why not every body that calls itself a church is populated by people who seek first the kingdom. Well, I would say that what we're describing, and this has been my experience, I left quote-unquote traditional institutional Christianity in 1988. It's a long time ago. And I've been meeting with what I would term kingdom communities in different cities throughout that time, even had a hand in raising some of them up. But I would say that they are, in our time, exotically rare. Most of the churches do not operate like that. Most of the churches actually have been captured by the world system. They operate just like a business. You have a CEO at the top, you have a human hierarchy operating. And for those of you who don't know about my feelings about human hierarchy, there's a, an article on my blog, frankbella.org, called The Origins of Government and Human Hierarchy. You might want to look at that, but human hierarchy is built into the warp and the woof of the world system. My point being is that most of what we call churches today are, in fact, part of the world system. They're part of what I would call the religious system. That's part of the world system. It doesn't mean that they don't do good. It doesn't mean that God doesn't use them. But just like the principalities and powers, which are part of the world system. And I'm talking about the human principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. God didn't create the principalities and powers in the form that they are now. They are corrupt. They're part of fallen human civilization. And actually, there's a tie-in to spiritual principalities and powers. There's a relationship there. But nonetheless, God uses those human principalities and powers, those human rulers and authorities, to keep order in the world. They don't do it perfectly. And oftentimes there's a corrupt element involved <laughs> when they try to do it. Always is. You know, but that's their job. It's not the job of the kingdom community to try to keep order in the world and make things right. It's our job as disciples of Jesus in community to embody that kingdom, to demonstrate that kingdom. And I also believe that as we make one another the priority, and I heard recently a message that Dallas Willard gave where he said the same thing, that the implorations, the exhortations to love in the New Testament are almost exclusively referring to loving the brethren, one another. Yeah, and it's so, the best kept secret in New Testament <laughs> studies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, love well, you know, the, the average reader of the Bible will love one another. That means I'm to love, you know, every human being that walks the planet. Well, you know, there is love your neighbor, but the bulk, the emphasis of the New Testament exhortations to love is to love the brothers and the sisters in Christ. This gets back to that Galatians passage. The house of God is the first priority. It's one another, the first priority. And I do believe that when a local body of believers really begins to mature in that love for one another and taking care of one another and showing the world what it looks like when God is king in its treatment of one another and the justice that's supposed to happen there, the alleviation of poverty, all the things the world is looking for, that there will be an overflow. Yes. 
to the lost who are around. But John, I've discovered not only in my reading of the New Testament, but also in experience, and experience this kind of corporate kingdom life, that it's in season. That the ecclesia is not constantly going on evangelistic tours. It's not constantly trying to help poor people. It's not constantly, because if uh, that's all it does, it will burn out and there's no time for inbuilding. So there's seasons for inreach and seasons for outreach. A fellowship that's really operating on all cylinders will discern the season it's in and uh, not become completely outward to where it neglects the, the building up of the brethren, the building up of the body, as Paul put it. But it will also not be this navel-gazing insular community where it won't care about anybody on the outside. Yeah, yeah the church exists for the world. <laughs> and so the reason why we embrace the kingdom life that God has given us as a gift and make it the organizing center of our world is because our life together reflecting the kingdom is the means God wants to use to draw all people to himself. That's right. It, it is the greatest gift we can offer our unbelieving neighbors is exposure to the kingdom of God through our love for one another in the community. Mm-hmm. And it's the biggest difference we can make in our community. And I think just conceptually, I think the Bible lays it out pretty simply. God has two teams. It just to put it in the most simplistic terms, the world is consumed with sin. And God's got a two-pronged approach. He's got two teams. He's got the powers and principalities, right? The structures of this world, the governing authorities, uh, the various hierarchies, which we've already talked about, are in broken form and they are sometimes self-centered. But nonetheless, they exist for good. They exist to make this broken world as tolerable as it can be. Uh, It's their job. Mm-hmm. If anyone who wants the job of making the world a better place, God's got a team for that. It's uh, the government. Mm-hmm. It's the local government. It's the national government. It's international agencies. God is using them to make this world a better place. That's one thing God is doing in this world. That's team one. <laughs> team two is uh, in the midst of a world that God is using team A to preserve, to keep from getting too far out of control, God has this second project going on, and that is the formation of a kingdom community whose life together is itself a new world order uh, amidst all the fallen broken orders of this world that is a picture of what all creation will be when Christ returns and all things get ordered on earth as they are in heaven. So he is maintaining the old orders that are falling away And he is launching a new order that is a foretaste of the order to come. Yes. And um, when in in our baptisms, in our conversions, how we want to talk about that, what we sign on to as Christians is to say, I want to join the new order now. I want to be a part of it now in part, and I want to be there to inherit it in full when Christ returns. And I want to make it the organizing center of my life. And I believe that the new order that God began in Jesus uh, that is embodied in the kingdom community is the future of world history. And, and so as much as people want to make the world a better place, that's such a noble ambition. Mm-hmm. And there are so yep. many people in this world that will slap you on the back and say, good yep. job. And they'll reward you and they'll make you feel special and they'll be so thankful for you. Mm-hmm. That's team A. And God can use anyone to do that. Yes, even an atheist. Absolutely. And even someone who is anti-Christ, anti-Christian. Yeah. And it's good. It's immeasurably good for the world sure. that crime is kept under wraps. Mm-hmm. It's immeasurably good for the world that... I'm thankful for it. Yeah, <laughs> that we can drive on streets where um, people are all, for the most part, going the right direction at the right speed. <laughs> like we, The world, the fallen world needs these structures to yes. keep from falling to pieces. <laughs> But that's God's order of preservation. And his choice in Scripture is to use world powers to do that job. To do that job. And there's no shortage of people to sign up for it. That's right. Um, You know, uh, and there's no shortage of people with much deeper pockets than the church who are committed to doing that. The Bill Gates, Bill Gateses, and the Mark Zuckerbergs, right? Uh, They're doing immeasurably good things to make this world a better place. Mm Mm-hmm. 
uh, and they're making a huge difference. Good for them. That's good work. Our world needs this, and it is God's work providentially through the fallen powers of this world. Yes. Uh, but it's not the kingdom, yeah. and it's not kingdom work. It's not what Jesus was inviting his disciples to do. That's right. He says, hey, I'm beginning a new kingdom in the midst of the old yeah, ones right. that are passing away. Do you want to be a part of that? Do you want to make that the organizing center of your life? And by the way, this kingdom, is, which is starting out small, is going to grow and grow and grow and grow until it is the only kingdom left standing. That's right. Will you be a part of it while it's small, while it's unpopular, while it seems insignificant, while its uh, witnesses in world history are broken people like me and Frank, just doing our best, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, that sometimes have our good moments, but uh, often have low moments. Like, will you join this treasure in clay jars <laughs> that is obsessed with this kingdom, which is the future of world history, or do you want to join team A and make the world a better place, or what is probably worse, join no team and just you know sit in your house and watch TV <laughs> and uh, scroll through Facebook on your phone and do nothing. You know, I, if you're going to be an unbeliever, it may as well be on team A, be part of the solution for the brokenness yeah. of the world right. of maintaining that. But the better calling that we have, the higher calling, yeah. is the new kingdom God began in Jesus. Amen. I want to nuance this a little bit, and I don't know if we're going to part ways here, John, or, or not, but let me use your metaphor. Team B, which is the ecclesia, the kingdom community, I believe that Team B is God's magnificent obsession. It is His eternal purpose, His eternal purpose from the beginning of time, which stretches before Adams and angels, begins in eternity past, and will continue in eternity future, even before the fall of humans. His eternal purpose is to have a bride for the Son, a house for the Father, a body for the Son, and a family for the Father. So the bride, the body, the house, and the family, these are the images that Scripture gives us in both Old and New Testament. Those are images and descriptors of this beautiful organism called the Ecclesia, this kingdom community. And that's his magnificent obsession. That's what he died for. He died for the Ecclesia, Ephesians 5. He gave his life for her. And he is out of his head in love with her. And yet we rarely see her the way Scripture envisioned on this planet, but there is a restoration happening of it, of her. So that's Team B. Now Team A, in my understanding, in my language, doesn't really belong to God. It is actually part of Satan's team, the principalities and powers. I'm talking about the physical principalities and powers, the authorities, rulers. They're part of the world system, which Satan is the god of. But God has sovereignly taken Team A, which belongs to the enemy, and sovereignly, despite its corruption and fallenness and attachment to the world system, has, has sovereignly used it for good. So it's really not his team, but he's using it. His only team, in my view, is that beautiful bride. That's his team. But he does use it, so in that sense, he's making it his team. To correct the problems of the world. Would you agree with that at all, or are you see yeah, a I, different? Yeah, I can go there in terms of, I mean, God is appropriating. Like, humans are the ones who banded together to come up with laws and principles and guidelines to keep order because they didn't want to have to fear for their daughters all the time. <laughs> That's right. They wanted boundaries, they wanted principles shared, you know. So humans create laws and systems and structures to keep in check other humans. And I think the way the Bible talks about this is God appropriates that yes. that human desire to keep order by suppressing it violently, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Through separation, through boundaries, through violence. God appropriates that to keep the fallen order from getting too far out yeah. of control. Um, so it's not his team in the same way that Team B is. Right. I mean, Amen. Team B is his special creation. That's right. Uh, team A is his appropriation it's good, yeah. of human Amen. structures. We um, totally agree then. Yeah. I'm coming to see more and more that the world system, particularly the principalities and powers, i.e. the political system, we'll just say, mm -hmm. the rulership authorities in the world, God certainly uses them, and that's why we're to submit to them and, and not fight them and so forth. But it seems to me that a person who enters into that world and I'm not suggesting that a Christian should never do that. 
God calls you to do that, then that's what you should do. But there's a pretty slim chance of a Christian getting involved in the political world and not being corrupted on some level if they stay within it. Or let me say it's very difficult not to be. Because the, the structure itself and the system itself is corrupt by nature. And it is, it is ruled by the enemy. The spiritual principalities and powers are connected to the earthly principalities and powers, the structures, right? Well, I was reading uh, in Thessalonians, and I came across chapter 2, I believe, where Paul says he's desiring to see the church. He was only there for a few months. He mm-hmm. raised up that kingdom community. Uh, scratch the word church, folks. I just cussed. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he raised up this kingdom community of believers in the city of Thessalonica. He was thrust out. He was banished. If you remember the story in oh, Acts yeah. 17. Yeah. And what was he preaching? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. He was preaching that there was another king. And a riot broke out, and he was banished. And then he's writing to them, and they're about six months old. They're very young believers. And he says to them, I couldn't stand it, so I sent Timothy. And Timothy has come to you, and he's given me a report. And then he says, I've tried many, I'm paraphrasing now, folks. I've tried many times to visit you, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered me from coming. And I used to look at that as sort of a Pentecostal charismatic, which part of me is. Well, you know, the devil's just giving him trouble, maybe made him sick, you know, something got in the way. But then I realized that there was a decree where Paul of Tarsus was banished by the local government officials from entering into the city of Thessalonica. Hmm. And so he, having the eyes of a spiritual man who sees the spiritual realm, recognized that it was Satan behind those authorities who hindered him from coming into the city. This is one example among many, but I'd never seen that before, and it was mind-blowing to me. Yeah, that's fascinating. The insight I love about that is to see the connection between uh, the powers and principalities of this world the governing authorities, the nations and their governments, their congresses, their senates, right, Mm -hmm. as ruling bodies in the land that are operating in the jurisdiction, in Satan's jurisdiction. Yes. Like he has power in the kingdoms of this world that he doesn't have in the kingdom community, which is not of this world. That's right. Uh, And so I find it fascinating that people want to say, when I grow up, I want to be a high-ranking official in Satan's kingdom. <laughs> I just heard about 3,000 phones shut off just now. <laughs> no, but that is so true. Uh, sisters and brothers, we probably should cut it off here. If all of this is new to you and you have no idea what we're talking about, I encourage you to get a book entitled Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, and a book entitled Endangered Gospel. This will give you the background to all the things we're talking about, all the biblical texts, many of which we have missed as God's people. And we will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.